الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah and as such we praise him Furthermore we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exalt the mansion and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to also grant peace to his companions and each and every one, whether male or female, who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. Hell equal garment. This was the way you were supposed to read it. It's called an interrogative sentence. It's a question mark. Hell equals garment. This particular uh, question can be rephrased by saying, is it possible that due to a garment one wears, this person will be punished in the hellfire? This uh, question and consequently this lecture stem from a classical answer. One of the many classical answers those who are involved in calling to Islam often get when they try to convey to the people the prophetic narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealing with the dress code in general and in particular Isbal. Isbal can be in, can uh, manifest in many ways but the most popular way is one wearing his garment and his is important here because her is not relevant his garment below the ankles so the only religion in the world by the way uh, truly i mean other religions may claim that that does not entertain philosophers or philosophies is islam we don't have such thing no matter how intelligent you are if your intelligence is going to drive you towards refuting allah belittling his wisdom or thinking that he has legislated something that is not suitable for you, then that kind of philosophy is rejected in totality in Islam. No philosophy. So one will say, brother, Allah will punish me in the hellfire because of a garment. Garment is clothing. Okay, whatever you wear as clothes, shirt, pants, otherwise. This question is a philosophical question. I tell you the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and you tell me can that really be? This is now a reality. Even though we'll be dealing with this issue tonight inshaAllah Ta'ala this problem exists in Islam among the Muslims, not in Islam excuse me I take it back. This problem exists among the Muslims in, in many different ways concerning many different rulings Every time you present the Quran and the Sunnah, one's intellect tells him, but my mind doesn't allow me to believe that. So they formulate a, a, a personal perception of Allah other than the one which he described himself with in the Quran and other than the one that, that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And this is a very dangerous attitude. It is a very risky approach that every time we are presented with the Quran and the Sunnah, we have something else that we prefer and favor. And so, when it comes to this issue of the pants, where are your pants supposed to end? The bottom of your pants or your thobe or whatever you like to wear, depending on the country you come from. When it comes to that area, where are they supposed to end? Uh, you will find that the vast majority of Muslims have abandoned this ruling and this teaching altogether with the exception of a minority who have a fiqh position assuming they have a scholar who's well grounded has has been able to convince them that this is fine this is a minority the vast majority they don't have an issue of fiqh they have an issue of this teaching opposes my style my funky style i like to be cool brother and that appearance negates coolness. So whenever I am presented with you know, two options, 
Allah and His Messenger or what is cool, obviously to go with the flow and keep everybody in the society happy, I must go with that which is cool. Don't worry about Allah and His Messenger. I will worry about it on the Day of Judgment. I will deal with Allah on the Day of Judgment. Allah Ghafoor Rahim, the blah blah blah, I have good deeds, I do Salah on time, everything is going to be fine. This is called what? Philosophy. And we cannot afford to do that. So then, it's amazing. Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his final messenger. And he gave him revelation. And he instructed him with particular teachings that he was supposed to, and he did Alayhi Salaam, convey to us his followers. You know, the word followers, what does it mean? It means that you follow, you imitate, you don't just speak about it. You don't say, I'm going to follow you and you're at home. I will not call you a follower unless you follow me. His followers are supposed to follow him, obey him, believe him, so that they may enter Jannah. Look at it in the most basic words. Allah created Jannah and promised you to permit you to this Jannah. But He gave a messenger some instructions which He required of him to convey to you. Then He commanded you to follow this messenger in order to enter Jannah. And all of us unanimously claim that this is what we want. But when it comes to actions, maybe half or more fall short. We only say it, we don't do it. So let me give you a worldly example. You get hired by a company because you need the salary. You need fulus. Anybody here doesn't need fulus? Talk to me after the lecture. Everyone needs money. Everyone is working here, even though you're trying to build your career and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, if they didn't give you a salary, you will quit the job. No matter how prestigious it is. That's what it is. And for you to make this money, you have a boss. And this boss tells you, do what I'm telling you to do, and I guarantee you, I will give you your salary and a bonus. And somehow, some way, all day we're just arguing with him. He tells you, make coffee, so I'm going to make tea. Finish this project on time, I need two extra weeks. The shift begins at 7 o'clock, I will walk in at 8. So what is this employee, man? You really want to get a salary here? Do you really want to keep this job? I mean, the boss will be puzzled. You come in the beginning, please sir, my family back home, I need the money, I promise, I will do everything you want, I will follow the instructions, blah, 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 blah. Then the next day, you're already heads with him, banging heads with each other. He wants you to do this, and you want to do that. What is this? Eventually, he will say, are you, are you normal, my friend? Are you a real person? Are you a joker? What are you doing here? So, this is odd, right? But believe it or not, some of us, this is our condition in Islam. When you say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, you have made a commitment with Allah and His Messenger that you will obey Allah and worship Him alone and follow His Messenger. Once we come into the picture, we stop playing games. Yeah, but not in this area right there. I like Salah, Salah is good. Five times Salah, I like. But that malice, brother. This is trivial. This is not from the basics of Islam. So who told you to divide Islam into important and unimportant matters? Since when does Islam have important and unimportant matters? Never! Everything from Allah is important, otherwise it would have not been revealed. This we must understand. So anytime we come across a narration which, which expects us to do something, I'm speaking of obligations, not the sunnah, voluntary acts, you don't want to do it, that's your problem. We will lose the reward of not doing voluntary acts. I'm not dealing with that. I'm speaking about halal and haram. Once we come into Islam, we cannot play around with the halal and the haram. We must stick to the deen. Okay? So Isbal, don't worry, I'm not going to be looking at your pants after you leave or <laughs> the lecture. This will, you know, I will try to lower my gaze uh, at that time. 
But the bottom line is, we need to leave this place with some understanding concerning the dress code. Dress code in general, and particularly your thaw pants, sirwal, uh, trousers, whatever you want to call them in any language you speak. Is it okay for you to keep them below the ankles? No. N O. No. Never. At any point in time, you are not allowed. My brother and Islam sisters, that you're fine. You're the other way around. We will deal with this later, inshallah. Brother, at no point your pants are supposed to go beneath your ankles. Why? I will give you many evidences, inshallah, which will satisfy you. Satisfy you if you're looking for the truth. They will be very unsatisfying if you're trying to do the opposite. If you don't want to hear this, then you're not going to be satisfied. But if you love the Prophet Wasallam, if you really want to enter Jannah by being the ideal employee, you will have no problem with what will be presented to you tonight. Number one hadith is the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu ardah in Sahih Bukha, Bukha Muslim, Bukha Ri, right? You can continue half a word, no problem. ما أسفل من الكعبين من الإزار ففي النار. Whatever is beneath the ankles from the lower garment, whatever that is, is in the hellfire. Al Khattabi said, meaning the person will be in the hellfire. Not that you will be out in Jannah and your pants will be in the hellfire burning. You will be in the hellfire. Because of what? Because your pants are below the ankles. Brother, Allah will punish me because of my pants. Say, brother, don't get philosophical with me. I tell you, the messenger of Allah says, you don't say anything else. He said in Arabic, which we understand and translate to English, whatever is beneath, whatever goes beneath the ankles from your lower garment is in the hellfire. We don't doubt him sallallahu alayhi wasallam, nor do we think he was playing games. He was saying something just to scare us. That would be lying. Everything he said is from Allah. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He speaks not of his own desires. Everything is a revelation being revealed unto him. That being part of it. This is hadith number one, and that hadith is basic. That doesn't include arrogance and pride and conceit, which we will deal with later. This is basic, generic. Second hadith is an amazing hadith in Musnad of Imam Ahmad. It says, أبعد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رجلا يجر إزارة فأسرع إليه أو هرول فقال ارفع إزارك واتق الله قال إني أحنف تستق ركبتاي قال قال صلى الله عليه وسلم ارفع إزارك فإن كل خلق الله حسن فما فما رؤي ذلك الرجل بعد إلا إزاره يصيب أنساف ساقيه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was with his companions and he saw a man from a distance. He ran to him. Listen to the hadith. أسرع إليه أو هرول. He jogged towards him. أسرع. He he was hasty. He ran to him, and he told him, "Raise your garment." He said, "Raise your garment and fear Allah." The man said, "O Messenger of Allah, I have a deformation in my legs." He had bow legs. They would go into his his knees. From, if they, from the bottom, from the below the knees, they're open, like, uh, they're like a wing, and the knees would, would strike against each other. So this deformation he was trying to hide with his lower garment, because it doesn't look good. He told him, oh, Messenger of Allah, I have this problem, my knees bang against each other. He said, raise your garment. Verily, all of the creation of Allah is good. Even that deformation is good. Because Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created the son of Adam in the best fashion. So then it says, that man was never seen afterwards, except that his lower garment was up to half of his calves. A man with a sickness. 
he ran after him, told him, raise your garment and fear Allah. Oh, Messenger of Allah, I have such and such problem. Raise your garment, all of the creation of Allah is good. You probably never heard this narration before, but these are the narrations that are out there that we usually don't hear because some don't want to hear. But of course, I have to ruin the party all the time. Someone have to bring things that are hiding. So those who want to follow the truth will have an opportunity to do so. Inshallah, all of you are of that caliber. So that tells you a lot. The hadith of Ibn Majah, again Sahih, the hadith of Sahel, uh, Sufyan ibn Sahel, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Sufyan ibn Sahel, la tusbil, fa inna Allah la yuhibbu al-musbilin. O Sufyan ibn Sahel, do not drag, do not trail your garment below or beneath your knees. Verily, Allah does not love those who do so. Do you know what that means? I mean, come on now. Who doesn't love his mother? And I'm not saying this because of Mother's Day. I'm sure you know that we don't have Mother's Day. Your mom is your mom every day of the year and she has a special Mother's Day without the title every day. We don't have Mother's Day where people forget about their mother all year round. Then on one day of the year they hear some chocolate and flowers, just be quiet. That's what it is. That's what it is. They don't call her for three weeks. Then here, here mom, here's a gift. That's like buying your mom's love. That doesn't work in Islam. Anyways, we'll have a special lecture, inshallah, where we will blow this whole idea off the ground. But until such time, uh, that, that will be later, inshallah. Uh, I lost uh, my point here. Yeah, yeah, ex excuse me. Yeah. You love your mother, right? Now, imagine if you were at work or at school, if you're young, or wherever you are, and you get a text message from your mom. And she says, I don't love you. What will happen to you? I doubt any, any one of us will be able to continue work. Maybe some will, will, will faint. Maybe some will cry. Your mom, your mom tells you in an SMS, I don't love you. What will happen to you? You won't be able to speak. What? Why? You, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I can feel it right now even though it's not true. Because it's such, a, uh, it's such an uh, unappealing statement. So when we say Allah doesn't love those, what do you think we're saying? If your mother doesn't love you, you'll be traumatized. Then when we say Allah doesn't love these people with no problem, that means that we have love for other than Allah, more than Allah, this is shirk. We should be more, more concerned when Allah doesn't love someone, than when you, our mothers don't love us. Because that's Allah. Inna Allah la yuhibbul musbilin. Allah does not love these people. Say ma fi mushkila. And we want to enter the Jannah of Allah, even though Allah doesn't love us. Amazing. Amazing formula. It doesn't work in math, it doesn't work in physics, it doesn't work in chemistry, but we want it to work on the Day of Judgment with Allah. I want to go against everything He revealed, but I shall enter Jannah, somehow, some way. But that doesn't work. So that narration is strong. This is the Prophet ﷺ advising a companion. He has Sufyan ibn Sahel, calling him by his name. Do not do so. Allah does not love these people. He didn't tell him they are arrogant, they are pride. He just told them, once you have your pants below your ankles, then you are included in the ruling. I will give you more. Here's another narration. This is even more severe. In the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, the hadith of, uh, the hadith of Jabir ibn Sulaym. He said, رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ عَنْ قَوْلِهِ لا يقول قولا إلا صدر عنه قلت من هذا قالوا هذا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قلت عليك السلام يا رسول الله قال لا تقول عليك السلام فإن عليك السلام تحية الأموات قل السلام عليك قلت أنت رسول الله قال أنا رسول الله الذي إذا أصابك ضر فدعوته كشفه عنك وإذا أصابك عام سنة دعوته فأنبتها لك وَإِذَا كُنْتَ بِأَرْضِ فَلَاتٍ فَضَلَّتْ عَنْكَ رَاحِلَتُكَ فَدَعَوْتَهُ رَدَّهَا إِلَيْكَ قَالَ أَوْصِنِي قَالَ لَا تَسُبَّنَّ أَحَدًا فَقَالَ الرَّجُلْ فَمَا سَبَبْتُ بَعْدَهُ حِرًّا وَلَا عَبْدًا وَلَا بَعِيرًا وَلَا شَاتًا قَالَ لَا تَحْكِرَنَّ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ شَيْئًا وَأَنْ تُكَلِّمَ أَخَاكَ وَأَنْتَ مُنْبَسِطٌ إِلَيْهَا مُنْبَسِطٌ إِلَيْهِ وَجْهُكَ ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ وَاتَّزِرْ إِلَى نِصْفِ السَّاقِ 
فإن أبيت فإلى الكعبين وإياك وإسبال الإزار فإنها من المخيلة وإن الله تبارك وتعالى لا يحب المخيلة That's a lot of Arabic for you but here comes the English A man said I saw a man every time he would give a command people will hasten to carry it out He wouldn't say anything except the people would do it I said who is this man? They said, this is the messenger of Allah. He went to him, he said, he twisted it around. Instead of saying, Assalamu alaik, he said, Alaik Assalam. Upon you be peace. The Prophet Sallallahu said, do not say so. This is the salutation of the dead. Rather say, Assalamu alaik. He told them, you are the messenger of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I am the messenger of Allah, the one who if a calamity befalls you, you supplicate him, he shall remove it. And if you have a year of drought, you supplicate to him, then he will send down rain so vegetation will grow. And if you were in a spacious desert and your mount ran away from you, you supplicate to him, he will bring it back to you. In some of the narrations, it doesn't mention uh, Jabir ibn Sulaim, it says the man embraced Islam. Upon this, this is what Tawheed. What did the Prophet say? I am the Messenger of Allah, the one who, and he gave him da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't even begin a new sentence. He didn't say, I'm the Messenger of Allah, Allah, the one who, I am the Messenger of Allah, the one who, if a calamity befalls you, you supplicate to him, he will remove it. He linked the person with Allah. When he gave him da'wah about the oneness of Allah, and it's the, Allah is the one who responds to this application, he's the one who deserves to be worshipped, the man's heart softened. So he told him, advise me. If this, if this understanding is correct, this is what a new Muslim, new Muslim, just embracing Islam, he told him, advise me. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not verbally abuse anyone. The man said, look at the ta'a, look at the obedience of the Sahaba. He said, I never verbally abused anyone after him. Not a free person, not a slave, not a camel or a sheep. Even an animal. I didn't say, hey, stupid sheep, for example. Or some other word. Not even a sheep. Because he told him, don't, don't ever verbally abuse anyone. Then he told him, do not belittle any good deed. Do not undermine any good deed. Even if you are speaking to your brother with a smile on your face, this is a good deed. Then he told him, and keep your lower garment halfway up your calves. But if you refuse, then down to the ankles, but not below that. And woe to you from 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 uh, dragging your lower garment beneath your ankles because it is arrogance and conceit and Allah does not love arrogance and conceit. A new Muslim, he gave him instructions about where his pants are supposed to be and he told him that don't you dare put them below your ankles because it is arrogance, he called it arrogance and Allah does not love arrogance. It's not a joke. These are some narrations that many people are totally negligent about. Go to the masjid right now. It's very sad. Those who follow these rulings are a minority. But we want this majority to become, do we want to be these people? We want to be the ones identified as the followers of the sunnah. Not those who play games with the deen. One day they practice, the next day they don't. This ruling they follow, that one they avoid. That doesn't work. Now we don't want to be among these people. Because there's a risk of Jahannam. And none of us can afford to enter Jahannam. I'll give you more. The hadith of Abu Dhar in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, ثَلَاثَةٌ لَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يُزَكِّيهِمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ قَالَهَا ثَلَاثْ مَرَّاتِ قَالَ أَبُو ذَرْ خَابُوا وَخَسِرُوا مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِي يُنْفِقْ سَلْعَتَهُ بِالْحَلِفِ الْكَاذِبِ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said there are three kinds of individuals whom Allah will not speak to on the day of judgment. Listen to this now, listen to this. Allah will not speak to them on the day of judgment. He will not look at them. He will not purify them from their sins 
and they shall have a severe punishment. He said that three times. Abu, Th Abu Dhar said, they have lost. They have lost. Who are they, O Messenger of Allah? The first one, Al Musbil, the one who drags his lower garment beneath his ankles. And then the second one, Al Mannan. Al Mannan is the one who does you a favor and then follows up the favor with a reminder. Remember when I bought you these pants? You know, every time they do you good, they have to remind you that they have done so many favors for you. Al Mannan. This is not from the quality of a Muslim. You do something for the sake of Allah, khalas. Not every time you see him, but I did that for you, brother. You better remember. It's not, this is a mannan. And the last one, the one who sells his product by making false oath. Wallah, this phone is the best phone in the market. And he knows he's a liar. He knows it's not. Wallah, brother, this is the best. I'm giving you a great deal. Great discount. He bought it for 300. He's selling it for 500. And telling you in the market it costs 2,000. I'm giving you a good deal. He's still making 200 riyals. People lie, swearing by Allah. Wallahi, brother. These three kinds of people. Now look who the Prophet ﷺ put the one who, who, who drags his, his garment below or beneath his ankles. He put them with these kinds of people. Someone who swears by Allah lying. Someone who's always reminding the people of his favors. These are, these are blameworthy qualities in a Muslim. Allah will not speak to them. He will not look at them. He will not purify them. And they will have a severe punishment. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. But it doesn't end. There's more. We have the hadith of Ibn Umar in Sahih Muslim as well. He said, مَرَرْتُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَفِي إِزَارِي إِسْتِرْخَاء فَقَالَ يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ إِرْفَعَ إِزَارَكَ فَرَفَعْتُهُ ثُمَّ قَالْ زِدْ فَمَا زِلْتُ أَتَحَرَّاهَ بَعْدْ فَقَالَ بَعْدُ الْقَوْمِ إِلَى أَيْنْ قَالَ أَنْصَافُ السَّاقَيْنِ Ibn Umar said, radiallahu anhu, I, I went by, I walked by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi and there was, my garment was loose. Now keep in mind, they didn't have belts back then, and the, for, the nature of the clothing was different. They would have like a, uh, considered like a towel, and they would wrap it around their waist. This is what the izar is. So, but it was hanging loose, so it was dragging below my ankles. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi told him, Ya Abdullah, O oh Abdullah, raise your izar, raise your garment. So I raised it. He told him, more. So I raised it more. He was asked by some of the people, how high? He said, halfway up my calves. Halfway up my calves. Again, this is a preference. If you don't like it, no problem. Go down to the ankles, but don't go below. <coughs> if you don't like it halfway up your calves, we understand. The Prophet ﷺ gave the concession. We cannot make something easy, difficult. If Allah gave us uh, some room, we don't want to make it tight upon ourselves. Alhamdulillah. We have a concession from halfway up your calves to the ankles. But below that, we don't have. Now, one of the problems, my brothers in Islam, which are involved, uh, or which is involved in uh, keeping the garment in this particular fashion, is imitating women. And today, uh, this is one of the most strange things. We know the hadith of Ummu Salama. Well, there's the hadith of Ibn Umar, which was in the, in the Tirmidhi, uh, Rahimahullah. And Ummu Salama was involved. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Man jarra thawahu khayla, lam yunzir allahu ilayhi yawm al-qiyamah. Faqalat Ummu Salama, fama yaf'alu nisa bi dhiulihin, until the end of the hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu said to the Sahaba, whoever drags his garment out of arrogance, Allah will not look at him on the day of judgment. Ummu Salama said, O Messenger of Allah, what shall the woman do with their lower garment? He said, let him, let him, let it, you know, uh, uh, extend it uh, hands width. She said, but our feet will be exposed. And we dealt with the, with the lecture on women that the feet should be covered. He said, then in arm's length, but they do not increase. That means that the women are supposed to be unlike the men. Today, it's the other way around. You walk down the street, look at a husband and his wife. You can see the wife's ankles and her high heel shoes and her leg and her feet and her calves and the brother's pants are, whoop, you know, two feet behind him. It's like they're confused. Ibn Umar saw a man in this fashion. He said, hey, do you have your menses? Are you on your menses? He told them, oh, Amir Mu'mineen, I'm, I'm not a woman to have my menses. He said, what's up with your pants? Then he called for a man to bring a scissor and he cut him off for him. 
They were serious men. They didn't play games. I mean, if you say this today to the brothers, somebody will punch you. A brother says, are you on your men, sis? Why? Well, look at your pants. Well, of course now, you know, we're not used to this now because like it's the other way around. If you have your pants above the ankles, like, this brother is odd. And what's wrong with him? Why do you look so weird? But you know what? Wallahi, I've seen many beautiful things in this world. Not live, because I traveled a lot, but on the internet. People email you, you know, uh, rivers and, and, and found, you know, fountains and, and you know, uh, waterfalls, all kinds of beautiful things. Uh, beautiful things. I've seen many beautiful things. But the most beautiful thing I've ever seen is a bearded man with his pants above his ankles. Wallahi. That's the most beautiful uh, figure in the world. Is a man with a beard, mashallah, and we're not going to say anything else. A man with a beard and his pants are above the ankles. This is better than the mountains and everything Allah created. Because it is based on obedience to Allah. And once you obey Allah, it's going to look good. This is a natural consequence. So, uh, uh, imitating women will get you cursed. Imitating women will get you cursed. We, the women are supposed to keep their garments below their ankles, beneath their ankles, so their feet will be covered. We, my brothers, are supposed to do the opposite. If we are twisting things around, then the woman is being cursed for imitating the man, and the man is being cursed for imitating the woman. You say, but how many Muslims fall under that? We say, ignorance has spread. Most of the people don't know. Most of the people don't know. We ask Allah to pardon us for not knowing. Inshallah, for not knowing, we're excused. Inshallah. If we really don't know. But if we know and we don't obey, that's another story. Now that we know and if we don't obey, that's another story. So, here you go. Uh, let me answer some misconceptions. There are many misconceptions about this. People have a lot of arguments to present when we deal with this issue of the uh, lower garment. We have the famous hadith of Abu Bakr. Maybe you've heard it many times. It says here, دَخَلْتُ عَلَى This is Ibn Umar saying, دَخَلْتُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَعَلَيْهِ إِزَارٌ يَتَقَعْقَعْ قَالَ مَنْ هَذَا قُلْتُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ عُمَرْ قَالَ إِن كُنْتَ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ فَرْفَعْ إِزَارَكْ فرفعته and then this remained his case until he died. Anyways, I will tell you the hadith in, uh, in, in, in English. Ibn Umar said, I entered upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and my lower garment was again dragging. He told me, who are you? This is before he entered. Who are you? He said, I'm, I'm Ibn Umar, Abdullah Ibn Umar. He said, if you are Abdullah, then raise your garment. Uh, and then Ibn Umar said, I raised it and I never I never left that teaching alone until he died. Until he died, والسلام, he kept doing it in this particular fashion. Abu Bakr was sitting there. When this happened, the Prophet iltafata ila Abu Bakr, ila Abi Bakr wa qal, man jarra thawbahu min al khaylai lam yandhuri allahu ilayhi yawm al qiyama. The Prophet وسلم, said to Abu Bakr, whoever drags his lower garment out of arrogance, Allah shall not look at him on the day of judgment. فقال أبو بكر إن إزاري يسترخي أحيانا وفي رواية إن أحد شقي إزاري يسترخي إلا أن أتعاهد, أتعاهد ذلك منه قال لست ممن يفعل ذلك لست مما يفعل ذلك خيلا أبو بكر said oh messenger of Allah two different wordings of the hadith one says my lower garment is loose sometimes it gets loose sometimes we said there were no belts and another narration, he said, one part of my lower garment drags sometimes unless I tuck it in. Unless I tuck it in. Here the Prophet ﷺ told him, you are not among those who are doing this out of arrogance. Because of this narration, we have many philosophers who present themselves with this argument. Say, brother, I am just like Abu Bakr. I'm not doing this out of arrogance. I have no arrogance. I'm a humble person. I, I accept advice. I have no problems. Me keeping my pants below the ankles is not out of arrogance. Just like Abu Bakr Siddiq. We say, my brother, time out. Let's go back to what happened with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Did Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, go to the tailor or buy pants that were beneath his ankles and keep him in this fashion? No. But when we do so today, this is what we do. When we go to buy pants, we don't observe whether they are below the ankles. Or not. Who cares, right? 
Unless you have the intention to go to the tailor afterwards and fix them. But if they're going to be a perfect fit for you, you know, especially those what they call low rise and low waist, you know, the one that looks like, you know, uh, somebody was, you know, walking and then a person grabbed them by his pants and they managed to escape. But then their pants remain down. You see some of the youth today, you know, you could see his underwear and, and everything, you know, it's one of the silliest, uh, you know, uh, looks in the world. So he said, it looks like somebody grabbed him. Come here, man. And so he was, hey, hey. And he was able to manage and he ran away, but he never fixed his pants back up. And so they think this is style. So you see him eat, eating food and tamiz like this, and you know, behind him is like a green underwear. It's like, brother, come on now, man. <laughs> Get out of here, man. We're trying to eat food here. We're not trying to see your underwear and, you know, anything else. So this style, you know, the 50 halala, you know, you know 50 halalas? You know, 50, halala, 50 cents, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. I mean, the dollar is more expensive than the halala, more valuable. They're all the same. These people are all the same. They follow these, these, these funny people, man. And so, you know, it's not becoming, brother. You know, we, don't, we, we, we have our own style. Allah gave us, even when we wanted to fast on Ashura, huh? we wind up fasting a day so we would not be like the Jews. It's part of Islam that we distinguish ourselves from everybody else in the world. So we don't imitate anyone, we are imitated. We are the ones who have the style. The style of the religion, the style of the sunnah. Is there anything better than the, the style that Allah revealed? La wallah. But if we don't like the style of Allah and we like the style of the shaitan, that's a problem with our choices. We have a terrible choice. We, well, we like what, what the shaitan likes, but what Allah likes, I really don't like it. What does that mean? That means that we're favoring the Satan over Allah. That's what it is. So, uh, you know, this kind of, these kinds of pants, uh, you know, cannot be worn. Uh, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not, did not tailor them in this fashion. He said one, in another narration, one part of it continues to drag, but I tuck it in. He told Abu Bakr Siddiq, you are not doing this out of arrogance. Now, can any one of us compare himself to Abu Bakr Siddiq? And if you believe so, I say, excuse me. For one of us to put himself in his shoes, say just like he told him, I am like him, say brother you are not like Abu Bakr Siddiq. When the Prophet Sallallahu told Abu Bakr you're not doing this out of arrogance, he knew who he was speaking to and he knew who Abu Bakr was. Me and you don't qualify. So neither did Abu Bakr tailor his clothes in this fashion, nor do we have the status which he has. For us to use this as a, as a misconception that allows us to continue to do this in our clothes. We can't do that because we're not Abu Bakr Siddiq in any way, shape or form. The second misconception is that of arrogance. Some say that it's arrogance. If you're doing it out of arrogance, then this is the problem. If you're not doing it out of arrogance, there's no problem. This has been refuted by the authentic narration from the Prophet ﷺ, Abdul Rahman ibn Yaqub qala, Sa'iltu Aba Sa'id al-Khudri an al-Izar faqala ala al-Khabiri saqat. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إزرة المسلم إلى نصف الساق ولا حرج ولا جناح فيما بينه وبين الكعبين وما أسفل من الكعبين فهو في النار من جر إزاره بطرا لم ينظر الله إليه uh, عبد الرحمن بن يعقوب said I came across أبو سعيد الخدري and I asked him رضي الله عنه I asked him about the lower garment he told him you have asked someone who is well informed. You have come across the expert in this particular field. Then he told them, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the limitation of the Muslims, the male's lower garment is halfway up his calves. And there's no sin or problem, anything beneath that until the ankles. Then he said, whatever below the ankles will be in, will be in the hellfire, that's one ruling. Then the second ruling, whoever drags his garment out of arrogance, Allah will not look at him on the Day of Judgment. What did he do here? Two different rulings. First, by you keeping them below the ankles, that will put you in the hellfire. Second, if you do it out of arrogance, Allah will not look at you on the Day of Judgment and the other ones that we mentioned earlier. So this is not a shubha. Simply having them below the ankles is a problem. Having him with arrogance is double trouble. 
And those who imitate the rappers and the hip hop, and the, usually it is associated with arrogance. These pants that are way below, you know, you know, you know, standing like this. So you see the youth, the shabab today, mashallah, yani, we don't want to turn it into a comedy. But there's a lot of funny things we can say about the behavior of the, of the youth when it comes to their garments. And you know what? It is arrogance. Try it. When you put your pants, just remember when you were a young boy, remember when your mother grabbed you and she would put your pants way up to your neck, right? And tie them with a belt? You look goofy, right? You look silly. You know, you can't be walking around the street like this with your pants around your neck. Oh, I'm exaggerating. Around your chest. But when you put them down, you feel, you feel, air, you feel cool. So the arrogance is, is there. When you look goofy, you look silly, you, you, you have to be humble because people will laugh at you. But when you put them down, there's that sense of arrogance that is associated. Now, of course, I'm not saying everyone here whose pants are below the ankles is, is doing that. I'm just saying for a particular group of people, the way they wear their pants has to do with that feeling. And so that, there are two different rulings, my brother. My brothers in Islam. Below the ankles will put you in the hellfire per the hadith. Below the ankles with that attitude that I am super cool, I am special, I'm trying to be whatever, then that will also, besides the hellfire, put you in the area where Allah will not look at you on the day of judgment. And He will not purify you, not talk to you, and you will have a severe punishment. That's a problem. Okay, quickly. Prayer. Here's the most common view of the Muslims in the masjid. The brother walks in from the area of wudu, right? He's still, you know, wiping his, his, uh, the water off his arms with, it, with the, some napkins, the tissues. Then he puts them down. Then the first thing they do is what? You've seen this before? Fold, fold the pants. One, two, three, sometimes six, seven, depending on how long the pants are. And then, you know, the second one, then, Allahu Akbar, right? Now, now I'm, uh, I'm doing, you know, what is good. Only in the salah, my pants will not be below my ankles. Say why? Why is that? Because there are some narrations to that effect that Allah will not accept your salah. Your salah being valid or invalid is questionable whether your pants are below the ankles or not. Based on narrations whose the scholars have differed about uh, uh, authenticity wise and ap application wise. But let's put that aside. Let's put that aside. Others among the fuqaha say, your salah is invalid because you have covered your awrah with something that is haram. And they make a condition for you to pray and you pray to be valid that when you cover your awrah, it has to be halal. For example, if you rob someone, if someone was wearing some clothes and you rob them and you put them on and you pray, they say your salah is invalid. Because you have covered your aura, your, your private parts, your private area, and I mean the whole thing, with a garment which is unlawful. So they say, this is stolen, it's unlawful. These are below the ankles, it's unlawful. So your salah is invalid. That's a position held by some of the scholars. Meaning every time we are doing so, when we keep in the pants below the ankles, we are taking a risk. You say, brother, that's why I'm folding them. Say, guess what? There's another narration which refutes you. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from folding our clothes in the salah. You're not allowed to fold your clothes in the salah, or if you had a long hair, you're not allowed to tie your hair into a ponytail. The sunnah is that you let them flow. So if you keep them below your ankles, you're in trouble. If you fold them, you're in trouble. What's the solution? The tailor. We have to do it. Plus it looks ugly. With all due respect, a Muslim man, a Muslim man involved in da'wah, a Muslim man should always look good as much as you can. Nothing looks sillier than some folded pants. Whether you're walking down the streets in them or you're praying. Would you go meet the king before you enter upon the king? Will you fold your pants and go meet him? How are you, sir? He will say, what is wrong with you? Why you look so silly? Right or wrong? But we pray in front of Allah, so no problem. Why? If anyone deserves that you adorn yourself at the time of meeting, it is Allah in the salah. If folding your pants doesn't look good outside the salah, then it should look worse in the salah. 
So we need to stop doing it. There's no solution, subhanAllah. Allah made in such a way where the only solution for you to be out of the trouble that is involved in these two rulings is that you keep your pants above your ankles at all times. That way you don't have to fold anything and you don't have to leave them beneath your ankles and then risking the validity of your salah. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Last or before the last, we mentioned imitating the disbelievers, imitating the non-Muslims. And we said that the Muslims have a special way of life, a special style, a special revelation which Allah has blessed us with. It is not befitting or becoming of a Muslim whom Allah has blessed with this revelation to disregard it and try to follow the ways of other people. It is not becoming. Wallahi, we have been honored with Islam. Each one of you sitting here, he should feel honored that Allah made him a Muslim among the millions of people who could care less about Allah or His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if those who have been honored with Islam cannot even obey, cannot even fulfill, then what did we leave for the rest of the people? Don't we not, do we not remember Jannah and Jahannam? This is serious. This is a fact. This is a reality. And these narrations are very threatening. That's why many of the ulama, they say it's a big sin, it's a major sin. Whenever the scholars want to define a major sin, if, the, if you've been threatened with the hellfire, it means it's a, it's a major sin. And keeping your pants below the ankles has been threatened with the fire. It's a major sin. It's not a joke. So I tell you, I want to give you, in, at the end of this lecture, some verses from the Quran. These verses from the Quran depict what we are supposed to be, but what unfortunately we are not. What we are supposed to be, but unfortunately we are not. Listen to the description that Allah gave to those whom He loves. Listen to those descriptions Allah gave to His chosen, um, to the chosen among His creation, and let us see, are we among them or are we on the other side? Allah says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ Verily, those who live in awe, in awe, in, in fear, in concern, due to the fear of their Lord. They have awe because of the fear of their Lord. Meaning, they're always worried about obeying Allah, fulfilling His obligations. Am I doing what I'm expected to do? Am I keeping the kinship ties? Am I being obedient to my mom and my dad? Um, we have many shortcomings. These people are conscious of Allah all the time. They live in fear, in awe of fear of Allah. They don't, they're never heedless of Allah. Is this how we are? The next ayah. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ And those who concern in the signs, the verses of their Lord, they believe. When they hear the hadith, they believe. Not those who don't believe. Allah mentions it's a, it's a normal quality. Can you be a believer unless you believe in the signs of Allah, the verse of Allah? You can't. But Allah emphasized that they believe, meaning they have total belief. When they hear these narrations which I quoted to them, they believe in the signs of their Lord. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ And those who do not ascribe any partners with their Lord, after, after they believed and they are willing to obey, they do it for the sake of Allah, not for the people. Not so when you see me next time, which happens, you try to run away so I will not see your pants below your ankles or your beard still shaven. This is not their quality. They don't care about what I think and anyone else thinks. They do it for the sake of Allah. Because some people be, become worried about other people. Oh, the brother gave a lecture about this. And if he sees me like this, it means that I'm not really listening. Audhu Billah, what kind of conversation is this? Who cares? You worry about Allah? Am I doing this for the sake of Allah or for the sake of what? Who cares what I think, what he thinks, what anyone thinks? This is a disease that we worry about the people, we don't worry about Allah. But these people are described, no. When they do the deed, they have no partners with Allah. Strictly for the sake of Allah. Then listen. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ And those who put forth, those who perform deeds, while their hearts are trembling of fear, that they will return to their Lord. Aisha said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is it the one who fornicates? Is it the one who drinks alcohol? The one who deals with riba? He said, no, O oh, Bintu Siddiq. No daughter of the Siddiq. It is the man 
who prays and he fasts, but he's afraid. He doesn't know whether Allah will accept their deeds. He doesn't know whether Allah will accept his deeds. Not the one who's like us. Today we have it the other way around. Allah is describing someone who's doing good deeds, but he's worried whether Allah will accept. We do the bad deeds and we have a guarantee that Allah will forgive. I don't know how we got there. I don't know how we got there. This man does it, many salah, many, many good deeds, but Allah knows whether I accept. We disobey Allah and we feel guaranteed. We have a guarantee Allah will forgive us because Allah ghafur rahim. But Allah did not describe that in the Quran. Then Allah said, after that, وَلَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا وَلَدَيْنَا كِتَابٌ يَنْطِقُ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ In case you felt this is a burden, I can't do this. I can't be uh, in, in, in awe of fear of Allah. I cannot have this. I cannot, you know, put forth the deeds while I'm afraid. Allah says, and we do not burden his soul beyond its scope. You will never be given more than you can handle. And we have a record which will speak the truth and they will not be wrong. No one will be oppressed. Allah knows who did this and who did that and why. Everything is clear to Allah. But then Allah told us the bottom line, which I am afraid that we may be suffering from. بَلْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فِي غَمْرَةٍ مِّنْ هَذَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْمَالٌ مِّنْ دُونِ ذَلِكَ هُمْ لَهَا عَمِلُونَ Nay, but their hearts, their hearts are, do not understand that which is being said. And they have other evil deeds besides that which they are doing. This is the problem. That not only we don't have the aforementioned qualities, but furthermore, as Allah said, our hearts do not understand what is being said. Follow, obey, follow the Quran, follow the Sunnah, obey Allah, obey His Messenger, we don't understand. And we have evil deeds besides that, which we continue to commit. So where do we stand from these verses? By Allah, each one do self-evaluation. Do we have these qualities? Allah al-Musta'an. We don't have these qualities, illa man rahim Allah, except a minority. We don't even know who they are. That's a problem. Because Allah is praising the believers. He's praising those whom He loves. If we don't have them, these qualities, meaning we may fall under the other category of those whom Allah doesn't love. And what a lousy life one leads if Allah doesn't love him. And what, what chances will one get to enter Jannah if Allah doesn't love him? This is destruction in the life of this world and in the life to come. So my brothers in Islam, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. This life is so short, every time we remind ourselves about how short this life is. It is some basic things we have been commanded to do. I will tell you the least thing, the least thing, assuming that this ruling is incorrect, assuming that the other opinion, that, if, that this will not affect you unless you're arrogant is correct, assuming all of that, I ask you, is it worth it? that one risks Jahannam because of some cloth? Is it worth it? Let's say there's a difference of opinion. Is it worth it that you will follow the opinion which is risky and may enter the hellfire because of a, a two real cloth that is downstairs? No, it is not. It is not. And you have nothing to lose, everything to gain. People don't like it. You remember the old example. How many walls do we have? Many walls, those who don't like it, may bang their heads against the walls until they, they are satisfied. But you don't worry about X, Y, Z. Worry about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once the ruling comes to you, do it. So inshallah, from now on, everybody here, the men will put this into practice. Okay? We will keep our pants above the ankles. Now, I have a surprise for you. We have a, we will make this a little easier inshallah. Uh, the same sister, may Allah reward her with goodness, who's always uh, donating something for the sake of Allah when it comes to these lectures, has done the following. She went to a tailor. Where's the paper? Right, it's called Al Fakhir. Okay, this is the map. Just in case you need the map. It is two buildings away from this particular hospital. You will have, each one of you will get a business card with a signature. The first pants is on us. Okay, this is to encourage you. The first pair of pants is, oh, not on me actually, on the sister. 
The sister has already prepaid for you to take your pants and get them fixed. The rest of the pants are on you. I hope you don't have only one pants. If you do, then your problem is solved. If you have more than one pants, then don't go fix one pants and leave all the others busted. Okay, you need to take all of them. Thaw, whatever it is. It will not cost you that much money. Wallah, it's five to ten riyals. Five to ten riyals per pants. You may protect yourself from Jahannam with a hundred riyals. I think it's worth it. I think we spend a lot more than that so we can protect ourselves from the hellfire. And if you don't use this card, then not only you are not benefiting us, you are actually wasting money. Because this money is prepaid. Meaning once you get the card and you don't visit this place, then in fact this money is wasted. Meaning not only we didn't utilize it for da'wah, we actually gave it to the man without anything in return. So please take advantage of this particular gift uh, via or, or uh, courtesy of the system. May Allah reward you with goodness. Take the rest of your pants. You may do one pants with him and the rest at your local tailor. Again, it's, it's small money, great benefit. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد